Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for June 28th, 2021. I'm your host, Jeanette dopp -Heidi. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is investigating secure development and practice, a human-centered process perspective. Our presenter is Michelle Masryk. Uh, Dr. Masryk is an associate professor in computer science at the Institute for Advanced Computer Studies at the University of Maryland and College Park. Um, this presentation is part of our Trusted CI 2021 annual challenge on software assurance. And so um, I will be introducing um, Sean Peiser to say a little bit about that um, before we hand things off to Michelle. Sean, welcome. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean Peisert. Um, I, I'm at uh, my day job is at the Berkeley Lab. I am also one of the co-leads of Trusted CI. Um, and in the context of this presentation today, um, I am also the lead of the 2021 Trusted CI Annual Challenge on Software Assurance. Um, the Trusted CI Annual Challenges are now uh, an annual event that we take on uh, an interesting and important problem to the, uh, the Trusted CI community and do a deep dive on that particular subject. Uh, this year, our focus is on software assurance, where our goals are to improve the robustness of software used in scientific computing uh, with respect to security. And we have a two-pronged approach. The first uh, half of the year, we spent gathering insights on what the current practices are with respect to software assurance in scientific computing. And in the second half of the year, we're developing a guide um, that's uh, targeted at the scientific software community uh, to, uh, to help them uh, understand and improve best practices uh, that they might use in developing software for scientific cyber infrastructure. Um, I will just give a nod that later this year we'll be looking for reviewers of the guide draft, and so please stay tuned for that. Uh, also, uh, with respect to today's uh, Zoom we or today's webinar, um, I have been following uh, Professor Mazarek's work in software um, uh, development practices for years. And one of the things I admire most about it is that she looks at the humans involved in scientific software. Uh, whereas uh, many of us from computer science backgrounds focus uh, uh, perhaps almost exclusively on the technical aspects, maybe a little bit on policy aspects. Why do people do what they do um, and not something else? Um, how do we get them to do something different that might help improve uh, the, the, the assurance of software uh, developed in different communities? Um, I think this is really central to understanding and advancing the problem. And so with that, I'm so glad that Professor Mazarek is here today. And I think you will find her talks fascinating. Uh, welcome, Michelle, and thank you so much. Thanks so much, Sean, for that very kind introduction. Let me go ahead and start the screen share here. Okay, did that work? Yep, looks good. Excellent. So, uh, so thanks again, everyone, for having me. Um, so uh, if we go back in time a bit, like maybe about mm, between 20, 20 plus years ago, maybe, um, there was a lot of discussion sort of in the security community about, you know, what is wrong with users, right? These users, we, we give them security warnings and they ignore them. They write their passwords on sticky notes. Like, what are we, what are we gonna do with these users who are messing everything up? Um, but through like a lot of effort by um, a lot of, you know, uh, really smart people who I admire over the past, you know, 20 plus years, um, there's been a real sea change in the way that people think about this problem. And instead, we now think about things like how can we make security more usable for people, right? How can we make it easier for people to uh, make good security choices with their passwords or their security warnings or using uh, encrypted messaging programs or anything else? Uh, but it turns out that end users are actually not the only people in the security loop. Uh, this occasionally comes as a shock to people when I give this talk, but developers, it turns out, are also people. Um, at least sometimes, uh, and you know, software testers are also people, sysadmins also people. Um, and so when we think about these questions, we, we have to remember you know, to think about these people as well. You know, if you're thinking that's okay, these are experts, right? These, these people you know, didn't get their jobs by accident. They know what they're doing. They're very skilled. 
so we don't have to worry about this. Uh, but it turns out that's not quite exactly right. Uh, so this is the go to fail bug, which uh, popped up in um, Mac OS, I want to say, uh, a few years back. I guess I was still a grad student, so maybe more years back than I'm prepared to think about um, at the moment. But uh, we're basically by failing to include these sort of closing curly braces in this if statement in some C code, uh, it resulted in the certificate checking uh, infrastructure being almost completely bypassed so that certificates um, would be accepted as valid whether or not they were actually valid. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times, uh, maybe we hear security experts asking questions like, what is wrong with our software developers, right? Why are they, you know, why can't they get this stuff right, right? Like we've been, why do developers still mess thing, mess up their crypto? Why do they still have buffer overflows? Like we've known about buffer overflows since 1980 something, right? So how come we still have these things? Uh, and hopefully, you know, we're in the process of also changing the mindset here away from like, what is wrong with these developers to how can we make secure programming easier? Because uh, developers have lots of things that they have to worry about and think about and just telling them like remember more security rules all the time like always double check the length of your buff of your arrays is just not going to work. Um, so in practice, what do I mean by this right, what does it mean to actually try to make secure development a little bit easier for people. Well, it means a few things, um, it may mean studying developers understanding their motivations their decision making processes so that we can try to come up with interventions that will fit well into their existing processes. Because if you try to give people tools that look really great on paper, but don't fit with people's workflows, then they're just not going to use them and you're not gonna get anything out of it. This also means things like measuring the tools and interventions that we do have, uh, which kinds of tools and interventions actually work well to reduce uh, security vulnerabilities and which ones don't. And, and you know, when being used, like in practice, right? Many things might work well in sort of an abstract sense or might be, or might seem like a really great idea when you first propose them, but in practice, you know, how do these things actually work? How are people really using them? Um, uh, and our goal here eventually is to try to build better tools and interventions or provide, you know, guidelines and principles for how to make these tools and interventions more useful so that they will actually have practical effects in improving the security of software development. Um, so today, in today's talk, I will talk briefly about um, four different studies in this sort of vein of work. Um, one about Stack Overflow, one about cryptographic libraries, uh, one about trying to understand the kinds of mistakes that developers are most likely to make. Uh, and then finally, one um, that's sort of brand new, uh, We'll be coming out just um, just this summer on using Rust as a case study for adopting secure languages. Uh, so the first the first one that I'll talk about um, relates to the impact of information resources on code security uh, with my awesome collaborators from Leibniz University of Hanover. Um, so perhaps something like this has happened to you. Uh, you're trying to write some code and you get some weird error. Uh, so this, this is Java code. So maybe you get some weird exception that you have not seen before. And you don't know what to do about it. Uh, and perhaps you then did something like went to Google uh, and typed in something about the error message you got or typed in the text of the exception message that you got. Uh, and if you've ever done this, uh, you, this next page may look kind of familiar. You may have ended up at Stack Overflow, uh, which is going to try to tell you how to fix whatever problem you've encountered. Uh, with this exception when you're trying to write code. This is, uh, if we were doing this in person, I would have people sort of raise their hands if uh, they've ever had this happen to them. But it turns out that when I do that, everybody raises their hand because everybody has in fact Googled some kind of problem and ended up at Stack Overflow. Uh, so, so this is nice, right? Like all the helpful people of the internet providing you with useful information about how to fix your code for free, uh, easily Googleable, this is great. Uh, but it turns out that this, these answers are not always exactly what you might want. Uh, so perhaps, you know, uh, in one example, uh, you're trying to um, figure out why you're getting a certificate exception and you type it into to Google and Stack Overflow tells you, well, you can solve your certificate exception by just trusting all certificates. Now, in fact, with 100% uh, certainty, this will solve your certificate exception. 
right? You will no longer get any certificate exceptions if you just accept all certificates all the time. However, uh, there are some reasons why you might want, not wanna do that, right? It will make your exception go away at the cost of actually being able to identify whether or not you're legitimately talking to the site you think you're talking to. Uh, and it turns out that um, from a study back in 2012, uh, my co-author Zasha and his colleagues uh, found that in fact, many apps do this. Um, many apps did sort of overwrite the certificate validation content uh, to just say, yes, we're going to trust all certificates all the time. And they sort of uh, in a you know ad hoc kind of way, emailed a few of the developers of these apps and said, what happened here? Uh, and some of them said, well, you know, I got this exception. I didn't know what to do about it. And I pasted in the solution that I found from the internet. We were like, oh, really? So this was, um, you know, a, a good motivation for us to try to measure what's actually going on here. Is this like a real thing that's happening uh, non-trivially? And how does this compare with other sources of documentation? Uh, so in this case, for Android apps, you have sort of official Google-sponsored documentation, uh, as well as, you know, things that you can find on Stack Overflow and other places around the internet. So to investigate this, um, we put together a lab study comparing information resources. Uh, we gave people four short Android programming tasks to do, which we designed to have sort of secure and insecure solutions. Uh, and we assigned them to one of four conditions, uh, either only using the official documents from Google, only using Stack Overflow. We gave some of them a book and we gave others of them sort of free reign of the internet to look at anything they wanted to. Uh, and in total, we had 54 participants, um, of which most were students, 14 were professional, meaning they were paid to write software in the past couple of years. Uh, and they were all required to pass sort of a short quiz showing that they had written, that they knew at least a little bit about Android programming. We gave them a skeleton app and an Android emulator to work in, and we gave them like four skeleton functions to have to fill in. Uh, and we looked for correctness. Does this code compile and work? We looked for security. If it does work, uh, is the solution secure uh, or insecure? Uh, and we coded these manually into predefined categories based on different types of solutions that we kind of expected people to come up with. Um, obviously, we adjusted them as we went if we needed to a little bit. Um, so let's take a look at what happened. So in terms of functional correctness, uh, you can see on this graph that the, uh, that the official documentation uh, did the worst whereas uh, Stack Overflow and the book actually did the best in terms of the number of participants able to get something up and running in the admittedly relatively short time that they had to work on, our, on the project for us. Uh, and we have in the paper some analysis showing this is a statistically significant result. Uh, so in terms of functional correctness, Stack Overflow is, uh, and the book are sort of the big winners. But what about security? Well, when we look at the security results, uh, this is actually, uh, somewhat reversed. So now all of a sudden the official documentation looks like the big winner. The book again still does quite well and Stack Overflow now looks like the worst. Um, so let's take a look at what happened here. So while people were working, uh, we had people come into the lab to work on this on this study. And while they were working, we collected their, their browser history uh, while they're working on this project. And, uh, and that included uh, they visited 149 unique pages on Stack Overflow, of which 41 were actually relevant to this problem they were trying to solve. Uh, among those 41, 20 included code snippets, of which seven were only secure code snippets, 10 included only insecure code snippets, and three included some of both. Uh, on the plus side, three of the insecure code snippets did have warnings that said like, this is a security problem. You probably shouldn't use it in like real code that you actually care about. Uh, but it turns out that, you know, it's not too surprising that people don't actually necessarily read or pay attention to those kinds of warnings. It's worth noting this was a couple of years ago and um, the Android documentation, for example, has been overhauled um, quite a bit since then. And uh, we believe that it's probably uh, a little bit better. In fact, we have some thoughts about um, rerunning a version of the study to see how much it has improved, although we haven't gotten to it yet. Um, but the sort of high level point stands, which is that uh, Stack Overflow is providing these kinds of quick and functional solutions that programmers are looking for, right? They have, they have things to do, right? They, they don't wanna like spend all day trying to solve these problems in a way that uh, at least at the time the official documentation didn't uh, and that other documents kind of written similarly. Uh, you know, a big part of the problem we, we believe is that the official documents were really written as like 
a guide or a how-to, which is great if you're trying to learn how to program in Android and have never done that before, but they weren't really focused on troubleshooting or solving problems when people encountered them. Uh, and they didn't really support that kind of troubleshooting well, and that's where people ended up at Stack Overflow. Um, on the other hand, uh, sending people to Stack Overflow can result in less secure results um, and, and sort of uh, results that you know, may appear on the surface to be successful, right? Because the thing about security is that it's like not obvious whether it's working, right? Like when you have an exception or don't have an exception, this is obvious, but whether your code is secure or not is, um, is maybe not obvious to the observer who's just looking for uh, a quick fix. Um, and so we really need resources that kind of integrate both of these ideas and particularly the troubleshooting. Um, so maybe adding a security rating in Stack Overflow to influence the upvote. Uh, modifying the official docs to target troubleshooting. So like I said, this actually, they've, they've uh, gone a ways toward this in the intervening time. Uh, maybe using Stack Overflow to help identify trouble spots. So you can use Stack Overflow as kind of a guide to what are people confused about, right? What are things that people ask questions about a lot or reference frequently? And this might be something that we need to cover in the official documentation um, to make it clearer to people. So any questions on this part before I move on to the second study? I don't see any coming in yet, but uh, I, I very much relate to uh, resorting to Stack Overflow. So thank you for that, <laughs> that review. Yeah. OK, uh, great. So yes, please do feel free to ask questions like at any point. This is definitely not um, I'm very happy to take questions you know, in the middle or at any other point. So OK. The second study that I'll talk about uh, relates to comparing cryptographic APIs, uh, again, with my collaborators from Leibniz University Hanover, uh, as well as Simpson Garfinkel, who um, is, I think, still at Census Bureau for a little bit longer before he um, switches over to DHS. So uh, it turns out um, getting cryptography right is hard. Uh, there are many, many examples of people messing up their cryptography. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorites, uh, just because I think it's kind of interesting that um, there was a PlayStation that was trying to make it so that you could only run um, official games and not sort of homebrew games on it. Uh, and they did this by basically uh, signing the software that you were supposed to use, but instead of signing it with a um, asymmetric private key, they signed it symmetrically with a key, which they then stored as you would for symmetric encryption. Uh, on the hard drive of the PlayStation itself. Um, so it turns out that, you know, maybe like two days after they released this PlayStation, uh, some reverse engineers found this code and were able to use this, um, this key to sign any piece of software and get it to run on the PlayStation Classic. So cryptography, not easy. Um, in recent years, there have been a bunch of new libraries appearing that claim to be more usable and claim to help make it easier to not make mistakes with cryptography. Uh, and the main way that a lot of these libraries, uh, especially at the beginning, were, were operating was to just reduce the number of choices that the developers had to make by making just fewer functions that you had to call and fewer parameters to call in each function. Um, and at the time when we started looking at this, uh, to our knowledge, nobody had sort of empirically looked at whether or not this was going to work. Right? It seems like it should, right? We're going to give developers fewer choices. They're going to make fewer mistakes. Great. Um, so, but we wanted to actually sort of empirically see whether this made sense. Um, so we put together a study, uh, very similar in structure to the last one, although this time we ran it online instead of in the lab. We gave people a series of short Python tasks with, again, sort of secure and insecure solutions. Uh, we tested everybody used one assigned library, which was one of either two traditional or three simplified libraries. Uh, and this time we recruited folks from GitHub uh, and we were able to get 208 uh, professional developers, most of whom had no security background, uh, which was great. That was sort of the population we were aiming for. Um, and we did have many more people than that consent, but um, a number of them dropped out uh, in the middle, especially uh, as we'll see using some of our harder libraries that we tested, uh, the dropout rates were very high. People got very frustrated and gave up. Uh, and once again, we gave people sort of some skeleton code to work inside. This time we used an online code editor based on Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so let's take a look at what happened. 
so in the darker green bar and the darker green at the top, we have our traditional libraries, uh, which is PyCrypto, which is basically um, the closest thing to sort of a default Python crypto library at the time, uh, and M2 Crypto, which is sort of a direct port of OpenSSL, uh, which is the you know very old and uh, frequently used uh, C library for crypto. Uh, then under simplified libraries, we had uh, PyNacle, which is a port of the a sodium library developed um, also in C for simplified cryptography. Uh, we used something from Google at the time called Keysar, um, which has re uh, since then sort of been replaced by uh, a library called Tink that Google provides. Uh, and we use something called cryptography.io, which is a um, additional sort of publicly available simplified library. Uh, and, and somewhat to our surprise, uh, in terms of ability to like uh, write some functionally correct code, and by functionally correct, I mean like tasks along the lines of you can take some text, you can encrypt it, then you can decrypt the result and get the original text back out, right? So this is what we're talking about in terms of functional correctness. Um, the simplified versions were <coughs> not necessarily much better than the traditional more complicated libraries. <coughs> in particular, people had a really hard time uh, with Kizar, as you can see. Um, but there was, you know, uh, even the other ones were not, you know, drastically better than the traditional libraries. Uh, and we asked people their opinions about these libraries using something called the system uh, usability scale, which measures sort of usability of stuff, um, kind of generally defined. Uh, nothing scored better than kind of mediocre. Uh, the most disliked were Kizar and M2 Crypto. If you've ever used OpenSSL, you may have some idea as to why people disliked the OpenSSL port. Uh, you may not find that too surprising, but in general, people's opinions track their functionality results. So people who were able to get their code working uh, were more or less happy with the libraries and people who were not able to get their code working were less happy uh, or were quite unhappy with the libraries. Uh, and in particular, participants comments related heavily toward documentation here. Uh, so, for example, for Kizar, we had someone tell us that uh, the documentation is bad and you should feel bad. But let's take a look at what happened with the security results. Um, so here we really do see that the simplified libraries do make a difference. Uh, it's worth noting that these are only among people who are actually able to complete the task in the first place. Uh, and so what we can see here is that if you can actually get these simplified libraries to work, so if you could get Kizar to work, for example, um, you can actually end up with more secure results in the end. Um, and there are sort of fewer, uh, fewer security mistakes. So what happened here? Uh, well, in the traditional libraries, there were a lot of bad choices of parameters and combinations. And this was sometimes related to documentation examples. So for example, um, the sort of uh, default choice under the PyCrypto library at the time was to use ECB mode. And that's what the examples included. And so if you just sort of followed along with the examples in the PyCrypto documentation, you would end up with ECB mode, which is non-deterministic uh, encryption and sort of like the worst possible choice that is available for you to use. Um, and so we did have uh, a bunch of people who, you know, reported being really happy with their, um, with their results because they've really followed along with the documentation and they thought they did it like exactly correctly, but they got this bad result. Um, uh, and uh, on the other hand, so, so those kinds of problems were fixed by the simplified libraries, um, because when you uh, get rid of these choices, right, if you don't let people choose encryption modes, then they cannot choose ECB mode, and so this entire class of problems kind of goes away. Uh, but there were still some problems that didn't go away, uh, and in particular, a lot of these were related to sort of end-to-endness or not having the proper abstractions. So we had a lot of people struggle with things like generating random keys, generating nonces, things of that nature, um, uh, or storing a key once they generated it, right? So uh, even if you can simplify the process of actually, you know, doing the encryption itself, sort of uh, this is still builds in a lot of assumptions about randomness and secure storage and other things that these libraries were, were not handling and was opening up position uh, possibilities of people making mistakes. Um, so the takeaways from this study were that, you know, implementing crypto is uh, still pretty hard. Simplified APIs do promote security um, if you can use them. 
Uh, but we do know, you know, that uh, things that were hard to use drove away a lot of our participants kind of in the middle of the study. Uh, of course, if you were, you know, trying to write something for your job, you probably wouldn't just drop out, but you might um, give up on trying to use the secure library and just go use sort of an easier insecure library instead. Um, we found that documentation really mattered both for people's ability to use the library in the first place and their ability to use it securely. Uh, and that we still, you know, need to make some progress on getting to the right abstraction level and sort of covering all of the features and all of the sort of end to end procedures that people need for common encryption tasks. Uh, I can comment again that some of this also seems to have improved in the meantime. Um, I know that kind of the default Python crypto has improved and has improved its documentation and uh, not to include some of these uh, insecure examples as well uh, in the meantime. So, um, so actually, uh, I guess, do people have questions uh, about that before I move on to the next study that I was going to talk about? Um, I'll give people a moment to type if they want to ask a question, but um, I'm seeing um, now two times in a row documentation. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what, it, yeah. It, care to yeah. share your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think nobody is excited about um, writing documentation or trying to improve. Doc I shouldn't say nobody, not that many people are excited about that. But um, and I think sometimes people think that it's not very important, but I think we're finding that it's actually really important. It hugely shapes the outcomes um, that people have, especially, you know, sort of non expert people. Uh, but at the rate that we're sort of producing computer science grads uh, and even non-computer science grads who end up doing programming in uh, scientific contexts or in other kinds of contexts, um, we shouldn't expect them all to be experts and we should expect that documentation is only going to be increasingly important in shaping sort of the outcomes that people get. Um, yep, absolutely. Uh, we did have one question here. Um, you said that things have been are improving um, over what time period would you say that you've noticed this improvement? Yeah, um, so this has been, I would say it's been about five years um, since we first published uh, some of these results, uh, a little less than that for the, the cryptographic API stuff. Um, and so the, I'm not sure exactly when the, um, the Python uh, APIs improved sometime in the last couple of years, I think. Um, so, so in the last few years, kind of since we published this, we've seen um, improvements. We saw the, uh, the cryptography.io people um, contacted us a bit and we talked to them about, you know, could they um, improve some of the stuff in their API? Um, the Python documentation improved. Uh, unrelatedly, I think uh, Google put out this uh, Tink library, which I think they had been working on like well before our study, which, um, which uh, has more documentation. And so we haven't tested it, but it seems like likely to work a bit better um, than the one that we did test. So again, this is one of these things where we should go back, um, you know, maybe in another year or two and uh, revisit this whole thing and see if we can figure out, you know, how much improvement actually, right? Things things appear improved, but of course, uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in empiricism. So uh, it's worth going back to check and see whether these um, improvements that people are making are actually going to result in improved outcomes, although it does seem like they should. Thank you. Let's uh, let's continue. Okay. Um, so, uh, so the third study that I'll talk about uh, relates to um, understanding security mistakes that developers make, and this is with my colleagues at UMD, um, Dan, Kelsey, James, and Mike. Uh, so so far, I've been talking about lab studies where we bring people uh, into the lab, or they do it online, but still we sort of give them a short assignment to complete. Uh, and they complete it, you know, in about maybe uh, an hour and a half or two hours of work um, to try to test these things. And these are great. I, I love that we have them and can do them. Uh, they make it really easy to control the situation and make good comparisons, right? We can assign people to use exactly one library um, and compare the outcomes that we get. But um, when you can only get people to work on a problem for, you know, a few hours, there's just a limit to how complicated the problems you can give them are. Whereas, of course, in real life, software developers work on very complicated problems that they work on for, you know, weeks, months, not just a couple of hours at a time, uh, which means that, you know, we can't make uh, our problems as, as realistic as we might like. Um, on the other hand, we could, uh, we can do things like uh, 
uh, try to measure stuff uh, that has happened in the real world. So we can do, people do things like go through uh, GitHub code or go through uh, Android apps that have been published and measure, you know, how many apps are uh, handling certificates incorrectly or how many apps are using uh, incorrect cryptography. And this is really great too. It's really useful information to have, um, but it's very hard to make comparisons in this way, right? It's very hard to understand why these changes happen because you're kind of looking at the outcomes, but without any control over the inputs. Um, so we need all of these things, uh, but we were wondering if there's another point in the trade-off space here that we can also try to give us uh, a slightly different perspective on the situation. And again, I'm a big believer in like many perspectives on the same problem uh, because it's hard to get a, a complete view from any perspective. And so the more you can look at it, the better you can understand it. Uh, and so one of these points that we decided to try is something called that we call the build it, break it, fix it competition. This is a secure development contest that's been run um, uh, every once in a while at UMD for the last few years. Uh, and it works like this. We give everybody the same project spec. So we give them some assignment to work on uh, and they get about two weeks to try to build that, to try to solve that problem the best that they can. Uh, and in particular, as you go along, you score points first by adding more features. So the, the closer to the complete spec that you get, the more, uh, the more points that you have, the more correctness tests you can pass. Uh, they also get points for performance. So if your code runs faster or uses less memory, uh, depending on the specifics of the assignment, you can also gain more points. So this is sort of uh, over time, you know, over about two weeks, you can see people's scores going up as they improve their code and finish, uh, finish implementing things. Uh, then we hit the break it round where teams try to find vulnerabilities in other people's code. Uh, and as people find bugs in your code, that takes points away from you. So at the time when you're building, you have to think about security because the more bugs that can be found, uh, the more points are gonna be taken away from you in your scoring. Uh, and teams also score points for themselves by breaking other teams, um, but that's separate. Uh, and then we finally have sort of this fix it round where you can get some points back by fixing the bugs that other teams found for you. Um, there's a lot of details that go into planning this, the incentive design for how to incentivize, you know, how much security versus how much to, for finding vulnerabilities is complicated. Uh, this is all covered in our paper from um, CCS a few years ago. Uh, so I'll just kind of hand wave at it all for right now and just say we've, we've uh, spent a lot of time trying to get this uh, relatively close to some reasonable uh, incentives and assumptions. Um, so for this particular, uh, for this particular uh, paper, we, we looked back at several years worth of contests to try to understand in a qualitative sense, what kinds of vulnerabilities developers are introducing uh, and how severe and exploitable they are. Uh, and to do this, we actually um, looked at each project and each vulnerability in detail. And by we, I mostly mean our incredible grad students who spent a huge amount of person hours looking at these things. Uh, we looked at both vulnerabilities that were identified by other teams and also vulnerabilities that, um, that, our, grad, that our analysts found um, when looking. So, so our, our students found many vulnerabilities that the other teams had missed as well. Uh, trying to get as complete a list of vulnerabilities as possible. And we used a, pro a process we borrowed from social science called uh, op open and axial coding that allowed us to sort of develop categories for these bugs to try to understand um, what different kinds of bugs there were and their prevalence. Uh, and overall, the students uh, manually coded in detail 94 distinct projects, which uh, included 182 unique vulnerabilities in total. Um, and we ended up categorizing the vulnerabilities into sort of three top level classes and then some lower level classes as follows. Uh, and we will, I'll talk about each of these in a little bit of detail. Uh, so no implementation vulnerabilities were ones where um, the team did not actually uh, try, did not have any code intending to ensure some security property. And we sort of subclass these into intuitive so they miss something that's sort of clearly called for by the spec. So the spec uh, is calling for uh, an encrypted log file, for example, and they or a private log file, and they just didn't do any encryption. So if you just open up the file, you could read it. This is a relatively small fraction of, 
of the submissions that just sort of didn't try anything. Uh, on the other hand, a bigger fraction were what we'll call unintuitive vulnerabilities, which is they missed something which is important but was less but was not clearly laid out in the spec or required some additional understanding of security properties and what they mean. Uh, so this might be something like um, side channel leaks or not including replay prevention or missing um, certain kinds of integrity problems um, that were less clear, right? The privacy issues were, were more clear from the spec. Um, certain kinds of integrity were sort of less obvious if you weren't looking for them. We also have a set of bugs that we'll classify as misunderstandings, which is where our participants attempted to do something uh, for security, but they made uh, some kind of fundamental misunderstanding that caused it not to work. Uh, and so we have uh, one class of these, which we'll call bad choices, which means sort of using a tool that's no good for the job. So using a weak algorithm, using homemade encryption. Uh, we also included here using something like stir copy all over the place rather than a more secure version uh, of uh, to, to move buffers around because it's sort of like a, a, you can check the bounds on stir copy, you can do it correctly, but then you have to remember to do it correctly every single time, whereas you could use, you know, sterile copy or something like that to get you, or you could not use C for that matter, um, to get you uh, to not have to check on this all the time. Uh, a more common set of mistake uh, of problems were what we'll call conceptual errors, uh, where there's a misunderstanding in sort of how the security is supposed to work, um, which causes them to make a mistake. Uh, and this included a lot of cases of things like insufficient randomness, um, we also had an interesting case where one team used a pre-made encrypted database, uh, which was a great choice, uh, but then they turned off sort of full page integrity checks. So there were like per record integrity checks and full page checks. Uh, and they didn't really understand why you would need the full page checks if you had the per record checks. And so they turned it off in order to get their code to run faster. Uh, but this turns out to be a problem because now you can just like remove records or insert records uh, and each record, if each record is sort of checked by itself, uh, no problems will occur. It's only, uh, and because you're not checking sort of the whole page, you don't notice that some records are missing. And then the final class of bugs we looked at. Ah, um, yes, I see, uh, clarify the story around some, it's like no replay prevention. So basically um, in the spec, we talk about sort of the goal you're supposed to achieve, which is, so that one was for the problem spec was um, you were building sort of a, a client server architecture that was supposed to mimic kind of an ATM. So you had like an ATM client, which could send transactions to, um, to a server and say, you know, like withdraw $300 or deposit $500 or something like that. And so the property that we gave them was that, you know, nobody should um, be able to withdraw money unless they are the authorized owner of that account and you shouldn't um, be able to, you shouldn't be able to observe other people's um, transactions. You shouldn't be able to tell that, uh, to, to read out a transaction um, if you weren't sort of the authorized user of the account uh, just by watching the packets go by on the wire. Um, and so we found there were a lot of cases where basically you were able to, if you were able to sniff the packets that said like, you know, withdraw $300 from my account, and you could just replay that same set of packets uh, and um, with and withdraw the money um, without uh, without you know authorization. Basically, even if you didn't know the the password, you could just replay the same packets and have the same thing happen again. Does that answer the question? So um, so uh, at any rate, um, I'll give you a second to to type if you have more questions, but. Um, the, the final class is sort of um, mistakes, which we classify as kind of um, uh, small errors, like things that are uh, not about not understanding what was going on, but just sort of people make mistakes, kinds of mistakes. Um, so these might be things like um, uh, making some kind of small control flow error, missing a step, right? Forgetting to, um, uh, forgetting to include something. So uh, one of our, our replay uh, vulnerabilities actually was really interesting. The team set up a whole architecture for using nonces for replay detection. Uh, and they had basically um, some kind of linked list, which they were going to keep all the incoming nonces on. And then they checked every time they got a new packet, uh, is the nonce in the list? And if it's already in the list, we're going to reject this duplicate packet, uh, which seems like it should work. 
but they just missed the step where you insert the new nonce into the list. So basically the list was always empty. And so the replay check always passed. And this is just, I mean, they, they clearly sort of knew what they were intending to do uh, and it, it would probably have worked, but they just, you know, made a like silly goofy error of the kind that all of us have made and will make again kind of in the future. Um, and so, you know, overall in terms of um, prevalence, we see that um, this is the percent of projects, uh, by the way, that contained errors like this. So they don't all add up to 100 because many projects could contain more than one error, right? We can see that um, mistakes were kind of the least common class over here, uh, whereas um, no implementations and misunderstandings occurred in many more projects. Um, and even among those, you know, unintuitive, um, no implementations and conceptual errors were the ones that really uh, showed up in the most of the projects that we looked at. So our takeaways from this are that most people sort of understood that they needed security, but they struggled with implementing it correctly. Uh, and we found that, you know, mistakes were most likely to be caught by other teams who were viewing code. There weren't as many of them to begin with. Um, many of the mistakes were things that might have been found with sort of existing error checking tools. Um, uh, but, you know, conceptual problems are much harder to fix, right? It would it'd be nice if we only had like, like silly errors, which should be much easier to catch, right? But conceptual problems are, um, are a big piece of this um, and one that we don't really have good tools yet for fixing. So this is a like a huge open area of, of trying to think about, you know, how to solve some of these things. As a person who teaches our undergrad security class, like this tracks very well with, um, when I teach this class, people kind of grok confidentiality immediately and they struggle really hard with integrity. Like confidentiality, yes, integrity, no. And figuring out how we're gonna get people to like, really understand what this means um, is a pretty big kind of open remaining challenge. Um, and any more questions about that before I move on to the next study? I know we're, we're coming up on time a little bit. I think we're doing okay. Um, I, I find this uh, build it, break it, fix it challenge fascinating. I hope more uh, professors are taking on similar uh, competitions in their, in their schools for sure. Thanks. Uh, All right, okay. let's, yep, let's continue, please. Sounds good. Um, okay, so uh, the final study that I'll, that I'll chat about today is um, just uh, benefits and drawbacks of adopting a secure programming language with REST as a case study. This is um, with my colleagues at, uh, at the University of Maryland, and this is actually gonna come out um, at SOUPS, uh, the Usable Security and Privacy um, Symposium in August. Um, so it turns out memory safety bugs are still a major problem. Um, even though we've known about them forever, we know how to fix them. Uh, we still can't seem to get rid of them. Uh, and there's here's just a bunch of stats showing that like 70% uh, of high vulnerabilities in Chrome, 70% of Microsoft security updates relate to memory safety bugs, um, buffers, use after freeze related things. And C and C++ code is still a big source of these bugs um, that we can't seem to get rid of. Uh, so we need to either figure out how to fix fix all of these bugs, um, or uh, or you know go back and uh, and not introduce them in the first place, or we maybe need to figure out how you know how can we avoid this in the first place, which maybe means you know better tools for finding these problems in C and C++. Um, which many people have been working on for a long time, but also means maybe switching to new safer languages that just get rid of these problems um, so that we just can't have these kinds of vulnerabilities anymore. Uh, and there's been a bunch of movement in this space, right? We have Rust, we have um, Google's Go, we have other kinds of languages that are uh, specifically designed to, you know, the reason why people keep using C and C++, right? There's lots of reasons. Part of it is legacy code, part of it is because People want to be close to the bare metal. They want to be able to run fast code and talk to device drivers and things like this. So, um, so languages like this are trying to split the difference here uh, and, and sort of create memory safety while still providing at least some of these benefits of this low level code. Um, and Rust is, is sort of one example, um, which is attempting to you know, get you the similar performance by having no garbage collection while still having a lot of safety um, and being useful. And um, we wanted to try to understand, you know, what does it look like when people try to adopt Rust? Like if we think that, you know, getting rid of these memory safety bugs is important and we think that 
new languages are one way we might try to do this. Um, you know, what, what, could, what does it actually mean to try to switch over to a language like this? Um, and what kinds of human and organizational factors uh, matter? And I want to comment that, you know, we don't have a particular um, uh, uh, brief for Rust, I guess, right? We're not here to, to cheerlead for Rust specifically, uh, but Rust has a lot of popularity and uh, has sort of the most uh, distinctive properties in terms of not having garbage collection. So it seemed like a good place to start for a case study. So uh, what we did was we were able to interview 16 senior developers, um, managers, principal engineers, things of that nature uh, at big and small software companies that had attempted to introduce Rust, uh, many of them successfully, but not all of them. Uh, and then we followed that up with a, a survey of the Rust community uh, in Rust forums based on some of the findings from the initial interviews uh, with 178 participants for that. And I'll just hit a few of the highlights of what we found here. Oh, uh, memory check tools exist. Can they be included in the compiler? Um, so they potentially can. So there's there's just a like a long history of work on um, on doing these things, and they definitely help for sure. Um, but they don't seem to have solved the problem. Um, they uh oh, are we still there? Okay, my monitor is freaking out a little bit. Okay, no, we can still see you. That's good. It seems to fix itself. Um, so. Uh, I think people do include them in their compilers, but they oftentimes uh, either, depending on how you configure them, they either produce too many false positives or, uh, which is bad because it turns out that false positives in one way are worse because then people just start ignoring the tool altogether. You can tweak it so it will have few to no false positives, but then it's going to miss things. Um, there's nobody has sort of found the correct uh, answer there. And again, I'm not you know, necessarily here to argue that there's not a solution there that we can find, um, but but we haven't yet, I guess, right? We, we still have all of these memory check tools, uh, and yet we still seem to end up with all of these major vulnerabilities that we can't seem to get rid of. So I definitely think that's an important piece of the toolkit, um, but it's interesting to also try to understand what are other possible pieces of the toolkit that we might want to use, right? Like there's probably places where we're never going to get rid of C or C++. Maybe there are places where switching might make sense. And that's part of what we want to look at here um, to try to understand, you know, what, what does that actually look like if people try to adopt these things. Um, so at a high level, most people uh, were happy with sort of the security and performance benefits. So they found it to be kind of as advertised in terms of uh, it did provide, they did feel like it provided better security and they did feel like the performance was, you know, uh, good enough for these kinds of, um, for these kinds of code that they're writing that they wanted to be pretty performant. Uh, we talked to people a lot also about things like unsafe code. So uh, Rust includes this unsafe primitive, which basically says like, uh, for the next little while, I, you know, for this next section of code, uh, we're going to turn off all of the safety checking that we would otherwise care about. Um, and you might do this, sometimes you need to do this because there are certain kinds of, um, of things you might wanna do in Rust, like uh, you know, mutexes or uh, inter, inter communication things that really can't be done without it. Uh, sometimes this happens because people get so frustrated trying to fix the type uh, checker uh, or the borrow checker in Rust that they kind of give up and say, I don't know how to fix it, so I'm just gonna make it unsafe. So there's like a range of um, reasons why people might use it. Uh, and what we heard was that there were um, few and kind of ad hoc procedures to manage unsafe code. So you can imagine that um, if you're gonna, if you're adopting this language for its security benefits, you might wanna be very careful about when you suspend its benefits and sort of uh, just go ahead and use this unsafe mode. But at least so far, um, we're finding that most of the companies we t we uh, we talk to people who work there uh, don't have these procedures in place yet. Um, we found that uh, people reported the the worst part about Rust and about trying to adopt Rust is trying to learn it in the first place. Uh, our participants were learning Rust primarily from curiosity or because they perceived it as a marketable skill. They reported it as very hard to learn compared to other languages. Um, and about uh, three quarters of survey participants said it took them more than a week to get any code running at all when first starting with Rust. Uh, and in particular, you know, it requires a big paradigm shift 
because of the sort of ownership model uh, that Rust has in order to avoid having a garbage collector. Uh, it really is very different um, uh, than many other kinds of code that people have experienced writing. Uh, and so making this mental paradigm shift was really difficult for people. Uh, on the other hand, we found that when people did go, did uh, spend enough time to kind of get over this paradigm shift or make it through this, this basically near vertical learning curve, um, it did have some positive impacts. People reported improved confidence in their code correctness. Uh, they reported long-term productivity improvements. So basically they were, uh, it was costing on the front end trying to learn how to do it, but they were making it up at the back with sort of uh, less debugging and, uh, and less uh, testing of, you know, like weird bugs that don't prop up that, you know, once, once, once it sort of compiles and starts to run, it usually does sort of what you think it's going to do as opposed to sort of later kinds of debugging. Uh, and some reported <coughs> that it improved their security mindset in other languages. Um, this is maybe my favorite quote from the study. Once you learn Rust, you're one with the borrow checker and it never leaves you. Um, so we can see, you know, this is kind of reflected in this graph. Uh, we see a lot of confidence uh, and less time to debug, easy to maintain. But on the other hand, we see that, right, so the green ones are places where Rust is better than, than another language that the participants are comfortable with. Uh, the gold ones are places where the other language is better. And we see things like um, other languages are basically faster to design, faster from start to ship, faster to prototype and to compile. Uh, we also found that organizations had concerns uh, about making changes in general, right? So switching languages at all is a big undertaking, making an important change in the way your business runs. Uh, specifically switching to Rust, people were worried about kind of the very steep learning curve and the initial hit to productivity, like can we absorb this time that we're going to spend trying to learn how, how, to, um, how to do Rust and how to retrofit our stuff. Um, we also found a lot of concerns about maturity and long-term maintenance. Is this going to be around for the long haul? If we, if we write our code in Rust, you know, 10 years from now, are we going to have to find something else because Rust is no longer going to be supported? Uh, and they anticipated difficulty hiring enough Rust developers going forward. Uh, and so we see, you know, it's going to take a long time to develop things and not having as much confidence that the ecosystem will be ready uh, to support them, you know, in a few years when, uh, after they put in all of this effort to switch over to Rust. Um, real quick, uh, going back to the, the comparison languages yep. chart, uh, what were the comparison languages in that, that were used. Right, so we asked everybody to pick sort of the language that they know best uh, or the language they're most comfortable with other than Rust. So this is a range of things. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I can, it's in the paper, so I'd have to look it up, but um, all the things you would expect, right? Java, Python, uh, C and C++, you know, other, uh, basically whatever other language they that they know well and we're happy about. We decided to do that rather than picking a specific language. Um, because we knew we knew our participants all had experience had tried Rust, but we didn't know what other languages they had tried. So this we wanted to give them, you know, a general sense of how Rust compares to other things that they like to use. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and our participants provided some recommendations for um, other folks who were thinking about adopting Rust or encouraging adoption, starting small, picking projects that would really benefit. Um, from the change, uh, making sure that you sort of build in this upfront cost of uh, trying to learn the language and make this change, um, and then providing a lot of support through the transition. So uh, one of our participants suggested kind of make yourself an expert and then share your expertise, uh, because otherwise getting through this initial part is really going to be um, very difficult and, and you might not make it. Um, so uh, so sort of um, our, our takeaways from this were that, you know, once again, uh, documentation and community and feedback matter a lot. So I, I didn't highlight this necessarily in the results, but one of the things our participants really appreciated was that um, they found the Rust community to be welcoming. They found the documentation to be really good. And they, found, they said that um, it's easy to find answers when they have problems or questions. Uh, and so our participants, you know, felt that that had a big impact on their ability to adopt Rust, um, despite the big learning curve. Uh, we do see a need to still improve the culture around uses of unsafe. 
Um, and we see this sort of um, uh, problem where the steep learning curve uh, and the fact that the language is immature kind of uh, build on each other in a way where you know a lot of the costs of doing this are upfront, and the benefits are later, but because the language is sort of relatively immature, there's maybe not so much confidence that there's going to be a later uh, to get these benefits for, right? Like it's already hard to, you know, uh, to do things that have short-term pain for longer-term gain, right? And especially if you are just not totally convinced that this long-term gain is going to materialize, it's very difficult. Um, which says that we really need to find ways to to balance this a bit, to like make the upfront costs a little uh, a little less, or make the benefits a little more. Uh, feel a little bit more likely or a little bit more real. Um, so we're looking at uh, in our group um, approaches to try to maybe flatten the learning curve. Uh, this also may mean things like um, building out more infrastructure, um, training more Rust developers and making it feel less like a gamble and more like a thing that will continue to exist. Or if not Rust, some other, you know, again, this is a sort of a case study of Rust, but in general, this idea if we want people to adopt secure languages, we need to make it feel you know, less of a gamble. Um, so overall, uh, after talking about you know, these few studies, uh, I hope I have convinced you that sort of human and organizational factors matter a lot to secure development outcomes uh, and that empirical measurement helps. Uh, we try to interrogate conventional wisdom, identify gaps and try to understand you know, how does this stuff work in practice uh, and how can we take all these um, great ideas that people from the security and programming languages and other communities have put together for uh, improving secure development and make this into something that can really be used and have broad impact. Um, and some of our key themes so far are that documentation really matters, full featuredness and abstraction levels matter, you know, not requiring um, non-experts to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, that we need to care about concepts and not just about mistakes, uh, and that deferring the benefits of secure development till later while the costs are now uh, can create problems and make it harder to make progress. So I just wanna briefly acknowledge um, all my great uh, collaborators, uh, including students and other colleagues who helped with all of these, with all of these papers, um, all of our participants for generously uh, giving us their time uh, and helping us, you know, we couldn't learn anything if we didn't have participants to do studies for us. Uh, and the works, the, the various works uh, covered in this talk were funded uh, by NIST and by the National Science Foundation. Happy to take any more questions. If people yes, um, thank you. Um, I'm just going to grab the screen real quick and let people type. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just wanted to go over uh, just a few Trusted CI related community updates. First of all, um, hey, let's uh, let's hang out at Perk. So <laughs> we've got two events that Trusted CI is um, hosting. Um, first, we've got the Trusted CI, uh, the fifth annual workshop, and then we also are hosting a um, training session on security log analysis. Unfortunately, both of them are at the same time, so you have to choose which Trusted CI. A member you like the most and go and <laughs> attend their session. Um, but you can find more about that at perk.acm.org. And our next webinar is Monday, July 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is Open Science Grid with uh, Brian Bockelman from Morgridge Institute for Research. Um, also, the, this is a, an announcement that I've made before, but just to remind people, Trusted CI is now available as a the webinar, pardon me, is now available as a podcast. So if you uh, Google or search for Trusted CI podcast in your whatever podcast catcher you're using, you should probably find us there. Um, so we've got one, one more follow-up question here. Uh, can you give a flavor of what is different and harder in Rust? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of things, uh, but I think the thing that makes people uh, that, that, you know, is the most frustrating for people is um, related to something called the borrow checker. And the idea is that because REST doesn't have garbage collection, but it wants to be memory safe, it has very strict rules about uh, lifetimes of variables and also who's allowed to, who owns a variable and only like the owner of the variable is allowed to write to that variable. So a lot of things are sort of not editable. Um, 
and, and they only live for a certain period of time and you can't access that variable anymore sort of outside of its immediate scope. Uh, and so a lot of like really obvious thing, things that seem really obvious to people who've spent a lot of time programming in other languages like that you might wanna do um, don't work super great because you have to manage like, I wanna access this variable, but it might not still exist or I can't, uh, I can't look at it because I don't own it or I can let this other, um, I can let a different part of the code kind of borrow it, but then I can't look at it. Um, if it's being borrowed over here, then, then the code over here can't look at it. So it, it creates um, weird, weird paradigms of like things that seem like they should be really easy to do, like assigning values to variables that turn out to be harder than, than they look. Does that kind of make sense? Um, it is by the, yeah, but it's not just, I think the routine that declares it. There's also, um, uh, not just routines, but but also sort of um, uh, words are escaping me. But um, <laughs> uh, blo you know, uh, blocks within routines. Like if it lives over here in the if, it may not live in the else or something like that as well. So those are. are fun. Um, Sean, did you want to? Uh... Yeah, I, I any last minute questions. Go ahead. One, one more on this point, Michelle. I, I I don't want to oversimplify, but I think so. Th three of the biggest takeaways on the Rust uh, argument against Rust were harder to learn, less time to or it took more time to compile, and might go obsolete. I, I totally get the might go obsolete one. Mm -hmm. uh, longer compilation time is an interesting argument. Um, that's not one I'd heard before with Rust. I, I assume, um, you know, that that that's something that's going to hopefully go away relatively soon. I mean, the compilers will improve rapidly, one would expect. Um, the, the harder to learn one is, is the one that I find most troubling. And so it, so it takes a week to learn the language and you develop something that has all of these other ancillary benefits. It, it starts to sound a little bit like the argument against wearing seat belts or, or, or helmets or something like that. I mean, it, I, I'm, I'm curious uh, as to how much stock you put in that and, and if that's really the barrier. And um, if, if this isn't just one of those things where we just say, Wow, I mean, this is literally going to improve the, the quality of the planet if you switch to this language, you know, get over it to learn it for a week. Right. I mean, I think the week was for like to get, you know, a Hello World style program running. Right. So I think I think it was definitely more than a week, like to get realistic things that you might want to do running. Uh, that being said, I sort of tend to agree on the like, let's get over it. But um, but it is a real paradigm shift in thinking about you know, what it means to write code. And so I think there's um, something, maybe some things we can do here in terms of trying to make this transition a little easier for people so that it doesn't feel quite so scary. Like, even though, you know, maybe we should just say, you know, get over it and do it, maybe we can make it, make it a little easier. Um, so it's kind of a fun thing that, um, that we've been working on uh, in our lab is we're playing around with, um, uh, a postdoc that we have kind of put together a version of Rust that has garbage collection. It has all the other sort of type safety benefits of Rust, uh, but it includes garbage collection. And so this um, sort of gets rid of one of the pieces that's kind of hard to learn. And what we're curious about here is whether, you know, there are times when that might be sufficient because maybe you don't need like the maximum performance, but there's also, um, it's also not totally clear yet whether like, it helps in learning in the sense that like, if you learn Rust with garbage collection, does that mean that you're closer to being able to learn regular Rust or, does, or do you still have like the exact same, you know, have you not gotten any closer on the paradigm shift? Like, does it help to break the things that are hard down into different parts of it uh, or not? And so we just kind of, uh, we just ran a study um, using students from, uh, from Mike Hicks's uh, 300 level, um, programming class uh, where we, we tried some of them on Rust with and without garbage collection. And then they sort of all had to get to the without garbage collection at the end to see whether or not it would actually, you know, create this additional step in the learning curve. Um, and uh, so ask me again in like three months and I- <laughs> No, that, that, answer, that, but <laughs> that's really cool, Michelle. I mean, that's a, those are some really interesting experiments. That sounds exactly like uh, um, um, a, a, an interesting path. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'll just do last minute thanks to everyone for attending uh, the webinar. I will be working on um, cutting a, a file for this and posting it online, so probably within a day. Um, Michelle, thank you again so much for presenting. Any last minute comments? I think that's it. Thank you so much for having me. All right, great. Have a great day, everybody.
Bye bye.